start the recording. So you should all be getting a pop-up message now. All right, so good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the next installment of our season two webinar series for the Hippocampal Subfields Group. Um, I am so excited today. We have the distinct honor of having Dr. Menno Witter with us today to share his work about the entorhinal cortex, which Rosanna's cat is a big fan of, as are many other people in our group. Um, I had just mentioned before starting the recording, uh, we'll have time at the end for a question and answer engagement, a conversation of sorts. Um, but I ask that you leave yourself muted until that time. And then if you have questions throughout, please use the chat box. And then at the very end, I'll give you a reminder because next month we'll actually have two webinar series instead of two of our sessions instead of one. Um, so make sure that if you're curious to stay tuned after we end today. So with that, I'm going to shift it over to Raban for an intro for Menno. Thanks, Kelsey. And hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today with uh, Professor Menno Wheeler. Uh, so Professor Wheeler leads the Functional Neuroanatomy Research Group at the Kavli Institute for Systems Neuroscience in Trondheim, Norway. And he is also the director of the Norwegian uh, Research School in Neuroscience. And the current work of his group focuses on the functional architecture of the lateral and medial entorhinal cortex with the aim to contribute to the explanation of their functional differences. Uh, so more precisely, his group studies input-output in relation to local circuitry with uh, emphasis on the specific neurons and layers that receive or send information from and to other brain areas. Uh, and today, Professor Wither will be sharing his work, Anthorhinal Cortex Circuitry in Animals. So, Menno, the floor is yours. Okay, let me share my screen and get a pointer going. There we go. So you see my screen and my pointer, I hope. So thanks very much, uh, Robin and Kelsey, for uh, inviting me uh, and for the very nice introduction. And I, I really want to start by congratulating and complimenting you for this series of seminars. Uh, I've listened in and joined several of them, not all of them, because as I said, when we started to chat earlier on, there's a lot of digital happening. So it's not always easy to join all of them. But uh, I think this is a great initiative uh, for, for our community. And so it's a real pleasure and an honor to be able to present the work that uh, we're doing on the entorhinal cortex. And I, I choose the title entorhinal cortex circuitry in animals because uh, I really decided to uh, talk a little bit about the details as Robin said of the circuitry of the entorhinal cortex, but also emphasize that as far as we know, a lot of the, these details actually hold in a variety of different species. And therefore we could consider to take this as, oh, maybe at least part of this might be true in humans as well. And since most of the people in this uh, group work on humans, I, I thought it uh, would really be nice to do some comparative things within the details of the talk. So let me start with introducing you to, uh, no, again, it got stuck. Yeah, there we go. So there's two subdivisions in the entorhinal cortex that are color coded here in this lighter green and the darker green that are referred to in very many different ways. Uh, but for now, I would like to use the terminology of calling this one the medial entorhinal cortex and this one the lateral entorhinal cortex. That makes sense in rodents more or less because this is closer to the rhinal sulcus, which is right here. This one is slightly more medial, closer to the hippocampus, but as you can see, the medial entorhinal cortex is also more dorsal, and the lateral entorhinal cortex is also more ventral in the brain. And that is true for actually quite a few of the animals that I will talk to talk about. So using this nomenclature is far from perfect because the medial entorhinal cortex 
has lateral portions and the lateral and triangle cortex has medial portions in it. So that really becomes confusing and I'll try to avoid uh, adding to the confusion, but it's not always easy. So these two areas can be differentiated based on, as the title of the slide said, based on cytoarchitectonic features. And I'm not gonna talk about them, but you just have to trust me that in almost any species that people have looked at, there are like two large clusters in the entorhinal cortex that you can subdivide. Now, of course, there's a lot of debate and, and people can want to subdivide the entorhinal cortex in two, three, five, eight, and some people that even went up to over 20 different subdivisions. But for the reason of the talk, I, I really want to focus on these two main subdivisions. And the reason for that is, is that as far as we know, the connectivity, there are striking but subtle differences between how these two areas connect to other parts of the brain. And I want to start with what is in the title that they show differential projections to the hippocampal formation. And that is seen here. This is an example of a red. There's two sec uh, sections cut perpendicular to the long axis of the hippocampus. And in this particular section, in black, you see fibers coming in out of the medial and trinal cortex. Those fibers cross uh, uh, through the subiculum, therefore it's called the peripheral pathway. And then there is a terminal plexus in the dentate gyrus, that is this dense black line here, that continues into CA3. Then there's a little gap of passing fibers. There's a very dense terminal plexus here in CA1, and there's a very dense plexus here in the subiculum, and again, there's a lot of passing fibers in between. If you compare this pattern with what you see, if you do exactly the same experiment, so you label the axons that come out of the lateral entorhinal cortex, you see, first of all, that this dense terminal field in dentate gyrus CA3 and CA2 has switched location. Now, if you look at the green bar, here the terminal field is in the middle of the molecular layer, here, the terminal field is in the outer one third of the molecular layer. Even more strikingly, the two terminal fields in CA1 and subiculum have moved together. So instead of having two patches here in what is referred to as the proximal CA1 and the distal subiculum, they're now into the distal CA1 and the proximal subiculum. So there is a striking difference in distribution of the axonal projections that come out of the medial and trinal cortex versus the one that comes out of the lateral and trinal cortex. This is an example in the rat, but interestingly, this holds true in the monkey as well. This is a summary figure from a paper that uh, David Emerald and I published, uh, uh, what is it? It's 20 years ago, I know. And so here you see the entorhinal cortex of a monkey in a very schematic flattened representation. And just consider that this is where, let's say the rhinal sulcus in the, in the monkey and in the human, you could consider that this is the area of the collateral sulcus. So this is lateral. And if you move in this direction, you move more medially in, in real brain dimensions. This is anterior, this is posterior. So if you look at the patterns, and this is an example of an ejection. Again, we label the axonal projections from an anterolateral part of the entorhinal cortex. And you see there's a beautiful plexus in the dentate gyrus, but and there is a plexus in distal uh, CA1 and proximal subiculum, exactly as I showed you in the rat. And if you take an injection that is more medial towards what in the monkey is the medial entorhinal cortex, you see that the two terminal fields in CA1 and subiculum switch to the proximal part of CA1 and the distal part of the subiculum. So, this is exactly the same pattern as you see in the rat and, and in other rodents. The interesting thing is that the pattern in the dentate gyrus and CA3 is a little bit different. It holds true that you see two layers, one in the outer and one in the middle molecular layer in the very extremes of the hippocampus, but in the body, in the central part, the two fields really merge. So there is less of this differentiation between the two pathways in the, in the molecular layer of the dentate CA3. But in CA1 and subiculum, this pattern is highly conserved. And interestingly, if you now look in the human, and this is a connectivity study where 
people looked at, at correlative uh, activity in resting state signals. This is from the study published by Maas et al. And if you do two seeds in uh, a proximal versus uh, this, uh, uh, sorry, if you do two seed areas in the entrolateral and trinal cortex in red or the postromedial and trinal cortex. So compared to the monkey, it is one here and one here. And you see exactly the same thing as you see here versus here, that if you take the entrolateral seat, you're gonna end up close to the border between CA1 and subiculum. So here you're, I see an increased signal in proximal parts of subiculum. So that's this part here in the monkey. And if you move to the postromedial and trinal cortex, you get going to end up with a connective area here, which is more strongly in the distal part of the subiculum, which corresponds to this area here. So although this is, of course, sparse data and it's not real hardcore anatomical connectivity, it shows that in terms of functional correlative connectivity in the human, you see a similar shift, at least in the subiculum. If you compare a start of the peripheral path in this part of the entrorhinal cortex versus this part of the entrorhinal cortex. Now there's a second organizational feature with respect to the projections from the entrorhinal cortex to the hippocampus. And that has something to do with really the position in the entrorhinal cortex. So again, you're looking at a red, and this is an example of a red. Here you see the rhinal sulcus. And so what was done in this experiment, it was a paper that was published out of the group of David Emeril, with whom I collaborated for many, many years. So in this particular experiment, there's two fluorescent dyes injected, in this case, a blue one and a yellow one. One is in the dorsal hippocampus, one is in the ventral or intermediate hippocampus. And here you have one in intermediate and ventral hippocampus. And these dyes are taken up by the axon terminals and projecting back, proje uh, transported back to the somata in the entorhinal cortex. And what you end up with is a zone of cells here in blue that project to the dorsal part of the hippocampus and a zone of yellow cells in the intermediate entorhinal cortex that project to the intermediate hippocampus. And if you move the two colors further down, so now blue is an intermediate and yellow is in ventral hippocampus, the pattern of cells switches further ventrally, so away from the rhinal fissure. So now blue is in the intermediate entorhinal cortex and yellow is in the very medial part of the entorhinal cortex. Now realize that this part of the brain is a lateral entorhinal cortex, and this part is medial entorhinal cortex based on the side of our tectonic division. So here you see a gradient that cuts across these two subdivisions of the entorhinal cortex and really provides a kind of longitudinal organization, a kind of strip-like organization in the entorhinal cortex where cells that are closer to the rhinal sulcus or in the human closer to the collateral sulcus would be connected to more dorsal or more posterior parts of the hippocampus in the primate. And if you move away from the collateral or from the rhinal sulcus, your projection fields will switch to more ventral or anterior uh, levels of the hippocampus in respectively the rodent and the primate. Now this, Longitudinal topology is very well described and it's true. So this is another experiment that corroborates it only focusing on layer two cells. You see beautifully two populations of cells, one projecting to dorsal hippocampus, one projecting to the ventral hippocampus. And so this is true in mice. This is an example of a series of representations of the mouse and rhinal cortex and the mouse hippocampus. And if you look at two injections, this one and this one, this one is in the lateral entorhinal cortex. This one is in the medial entorhinal cortex, but both of them are quite close to the rhinal sulcus. And you see a beautiful projection to the dorsal part of the hippocampus. If you compare that to an injection that has moved away from the rhinal sulcus, this one in MEC, 
This one in LEC, you see that the terminal field switches from a dorsal position towards a ventral position. This has been shown in cats. This was actually the first paper that was ever published emphasizing this longitudinal component. Although I have to say that Lynn Adele had a paper in 1978, I think, where he hinted towards a similar organization, but that was completely ignored in the literature. We now have data in bats, and we're finishing the study, and we have data in the, in the tree through together with Li Lu, uh, a previous postdoc in the center, now an independent researcher in China. So we're working on showing that this organization along the long axis of the hippocampus is very, very stable. Interestingly, also, the previous organization where the medial antrinal cortex versus the lateral antrinal cortex has a shift in terminal fields along the transverse axis of CA1 subiculum holds true also in the bats. And it looks, although we still need to analyze a lot more experiments, it seems that it's true in the tree shrew as well. So now let's take a closer look at the monkey, just to emphasize the point, because I think this is important also for human imaging studies. So if you take the unfolding of the entorhinal cortex here, and you start with an injection somewhere in the middle here, it goes to the tip, the anterior portion. And if you move more laterally, you see that it terminates in the more posterior part of the hippocampus. So this is really to emphasize that there is this beautiful longitudinal topology that obeys if you move from here to there, you go from here to there. So from anterior hippocampus to posterior hippocampus in primates. So summary, this is what I tried to convey to you. If you take a rodent hippocampus or any other species that has a hippocampus that has a more or less similar uh, location in the brain, and you take a flattened representation of the entorhinal cortex, you move from the rhinal sulcus or from the collateral sulcus, in case of the human, away, you're gonna move from the posterior to the anterior or from the dorsal to the ventral axis tip of the hippocampus. And within CA1 subiculum, you see that if you take the terminal field of the medial entorhinal cortex or the more posterior half of the human and the monkey hippocampus, you're going to end up in the proximal part of CA1 and the distal part of subiculum. And if you move more anterior in the anterior cortex, or you move to LEC in the rodent, the terminal field will changes its position towards the distal part of CA1 and the proximal part of the subiculum, as you see here. So this figure, if you want to take a look at it, will be published very soon in a book. It should be ready at SFN uh, later this year, although it depends on Oxford University Press and the editors whether we'll keep the timeline. But so this figure is a summary figure that I put in a chapter that we wrote on antirhinal cortex. OK, so now let's look at functions. So here you have the lateral and medial internal cortex. This is a summary of what I just tried to convey to you. And now we know that there is this general concept that the lateral internal cortex seems to deal with information that tells us something about objects or things that happen in the outside world. And the medial internal cortex is much more interested in inf transferring information or dealing with information that tells, it, uh, tells us something about where does thing, where is this object, where do things happen? So, and to give you a few examples of this functional difference between LEC and MEC, these are just two cell types that are typical. So in the medial entorhinal cortex, it has been very well established that there is this amazing regular firing property of cell that is referred to as the grid cell. So here you see a cartoon, an autocorrelative diagram of peak firing of a single cell in the medial and trinal cortex, and it forms this beautiful triangular or hexagonal sheet of peak activities. So this is the typical cell that you find in the medial and trinal cortex. If you do exactly the same experiment, and if you look at this autocorrelative uh, correl, 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 diagram, 
This is the same cell. No, it's not the same cell, of course. This is a cell recorded in the lateral antrietal cortex. So this, uh, this is a box, just like this box. The animal's running around. You see the trajectory of the animal in gray, and there's absolutely nothing happening in lateral antrietal cortex. If you put an object in that same environment, there's suddenly a cell who loves the object and focuses its firing activity. So this is the autocorrelation diagram. You get a beautiful peak of firing around the object. And interestingly, there's other cells that don't seem to fire when the object is there. But if you remove the object, it seems to remember. It has a kind of memory trace that there was an object in this location. So these cells in lateral and trinal cortex are functionally coding for something completely different, the objects or where objects were in space. And I'll come back to that closer to the end of the talk. And cells in the medial and trinal cortex that tell the animal, where am I in space when I'm navigating? Now, these cells were first published in 2004. And of course, the field has not been sitting silent. So by now, we know that in an medial antrinal cortex, there are heterodirection cells, there are speed cells, there are object vector cells, non regulatory tuned spatial cells. We know that there is a kind of grid cell firing in humans based on fMRI data. There's grid cells in monkeys based on eye movement correlation. This is beautiful work of Beth Buff Buffalo. And in the lateral antrinal cortex, we now know that there seems to be a coding for time, not time in terms of clock time, but more time in terms of sequences. This has been shown in rats by Albert Tao. And there is a paper in humans from the uh, Mike Justice lab, Monshal et al. That was published in 2019. That seemed to indicate that also in humans, there is this coding for sequences of episodic events. So again, this emphasizes that the lateral antrinal cortex and the medial antrinal cortex are very, very different in terms of their functional representations. Now let's focus on the grid cells because when we discovered the grid cells, it was clear that they're predominantly found in layer two of the medial antrinal cortex. So therefore my group started to look at the networks of layer two, trying to explain why do we find grid cells in layer two of the medial and trinal cortex. And so first of all, I need to share some information that there are four different cell types in layer two, not only of the medial and trinal cortex, but also in the lateral and trinal cortex. That's important. I'll come back to that in a minute. So there are some cell types that express a protein that's called relin. And there's another cluster of cells that express another protein that's called calbinin. For now, it doesn't matter. I could have called them X and Y or whatever. It's just a marker, as you can see here, that allows us to separate between two cell types. And it allows us, therefore, to specifically target and study those cells. I want to draw your attention to this cell type here, because in the next slide, I'm going to talk about them. This is the so-called stellate cells. And I'll come back in a minute, and I'll talk about this cell type which are fan cells. They're both relin positive cells. And we now know that relin positive cells project to the dentate gyrus CA3 and CA2, not to CA1 and subiculum. Just to show you some comparative data in the monkey and in the mouse, you find exactly the same cells. Here, the relin cells are green. And this is the red as a comparison. And the calbinin cells are magenta. You see in the monkey in anterior antrinal cortex, you see um, relin positive cells in layer two and a majority of calbinin, layer, uh, calbinin positive cells that are slightly deeper, just as in the red. You have the green cells, the relin cells superficially. You have the magenta calbinin cells deep. It's true for LEC, it's true for MEC. It's true for, for the MEC component, so the very posterior part of the monkey and trinal cortex. And if you look at the mouse, you see the same in LEC. The relin cells are superficially, the calbinin cells are deeper, except in MEC in the mouse, the two positions are reversed. So here the relin cells are deep and the calbinin cells are superficial. But at least we have both populations of cells in monkeys, rats, and mice. 
And we know that in humans, there are relin positive cells for sure. And those are the superficial cells that form the islands of layer two cells or the verrucae on the surface of the human and triangle cortex. There is not really convincing data yet on calbindin cells in humans. There's bits and pieces of evidence, but it's not done very consistently yet. So coming back to these stellate cells, in order to understand the configuration and the network, we started to look at groups of stellate cells and we patch them in vitro. So this is slight preparation. We patch from four cells at the same time. Three of them in red are pure stellate cells. This is an intermediate type. And interestingly, if you depolarize three out of those four cells, so these three, I'm sorry, if you yeah, depolarize, so they start firing, you see that the remaining cell will always sh show an inhibitory hyperpolarizing current. If you permutate your stimulation electrodes, so now we're stimulating numbers one, three, and four, you get inhibition in two, you get inhibition in three, you get inhibition in four. So these cells don't like to talk to each other. They only use an interneuron in between, which is this guy over here. This is a fast spiking interneuron, and these are three stellate cells. If we inject a depolarizing current in one of the stellate cells, nothing happens or you get inhibition. But if we inject the current in, uh, if we inject the current here, you see a beautiful excitatory volley in the fast spiking cell. If we now depolarize the fast spiking cell, all the three adjacent stellate cells will be inhibited. In other words, stellate cells don't talk to each other. They need a fast spiking interneuron, which we now know is a parvobumin expressing interneuron in between to build a network. This was an amazing finding because then we developed a computational model that showed that this particular network is perfectly capable of generating this very regular grid cell firing pattern in MEC. So we were very happy and we decided, well, since LEC does not have grid cells, the layer two cell network should be different in LEC. So that's the next series of experiments we did. So again, we patch from four cells. Those are all four relin positive cells. There are two fan cells, and in this case, a pyramidal cell that also expresses uh, relin. So again, they're very similar to the stellar cells. They projected the dente gyrus. And to our great surprise, if you depolarize three, you get a hyperpolarizing or inhibi inhibitory current in number four. No matter how hard we try, fan cells don't like to talk to each other they preferentially like to talk to fast spiking cells that then inhibit a lot of the neighboring fan cells. So in other words, the network in layer two of the lateral antrinal cortex is very similar to the layer two network in the medial antrinal cortex. However, in the medial antrinal cortex, we find grid cells in layer two, and in the lateral antrinal cortex, we do not find grid cells in layer two. So this is a little bit of a puzzling observation. And so we went in a variety of different ways to figure this out. So this is the summary of what I showed you. Fan cells need a fast spiking PV positive interneuron. Stellate cells need a fast spiking PV positive interneuron to communicate to each other within the network. So there's no striking differences. So then we decided let's move to the other side of the structure, which is layer five. Layer five in antrinal cortex in any paper is considered just like in the neocortex as a major output layer. And just to convince you that that's uh, the case, we started to look at output pathways of layer five. The interesting thing about layer five is that it's an output pathway that mediates hippocampal output. And this is to show that that's the case. So the movie will be circulating. You're looking at an in vitro slice of a piece of hippocampus, entorhinal cortex, and the adjacent perirhinal cortex. We have a stimulation electrode here in dente gyrus. And this is a representation of excitatory signals. And the redder, the warmer the colors, the stronger the excitation. So what you see is a beautiful loop along the hippocampal circuit 
going into deep EC, superficial EC, watch deep, superficial, and into the cortex. So layer five is a major recipient of hippocampal signals that is then conveyed to the perirhinal cortex. So we decided to look into more detail into layer five. And the first paper that was published that helped us to work on this was a paper from Matt Nolan's lab in 2016, who reported that in the uh, uh, medial and trinal cortex, um, layer 5a and 5b can be separated by the expression of a certain gene, which is C tip 2 And there's another gene that labels the same population of cells, which is PCP4. And layer 5a cells do not express the gene. It expresses another gene, ETV1, or called ER81, is specific for 5a. So layer 5 that I showed you in the movie conveys hippocampal output to other structures, including cortex and lateral encephalon, can be subdivided into two layers. So we started to ask, what is the difference between two layers? And can we compare the two layers in LEC and MEC? So first of all, to show that it's actually the cells in layer 5A that is output. Just to give you one exa two examples, we injected a tracer that is taken up by axon terminals in the medial prefrontal cortex. And you get labeling beautifully in layer 5A here and here in the medial and trinal cortex but there's nothing in 5B. If we do a similar experiment and we inject a retrograde transporter tracer in the amygdala, or we could have taken any cortical area, it doesn't matter. You get beautiful cells in 5A, virtually nothing in 5B, lots of cells in 5A, very little in 5B. So 5A is the output layer that connects the entorial cortex to other telencephalic structures could be subcortical, could be cortical. This is true in the monkey and the mouse as well. Here you see cells in yellow that project in this case to the nucleus accumbens. I just picked one example. So this is the output layer in 5A as I ch showed you in the rat. In the mouse, we see something very similar in the lateral and trinal cortex. In the medial and trinal cortex, 5A cells are yellow, 5A cells are yellow. The blue cells are the PCP4, so that's 5B. In the monkey, you see yellow cells throughout 5A and 5B, 5B being defined by the expression of this gene. But there's no overlap. So there's no of the, none of the blue cells is also yellow. So although the lamination is lost here, the lamination is beautifully preserved in the more caudal parts of the monkey and trinal cortex where you have yellow cells, where there are no blue cells, and you have blue cells where there are no yellow cells, similar as you see here in the red, and similar as you see here in the mouse. So again, this is a very highly conserved phenomenon that there are two cell types, one that expresses a certain gene, in this case PCP4 or CTIP4, that do not project to other telencephalic areas, and other cells that do project to telencephalic areas. Now, this is important because then we ask the question, if 5A cells, so this is two sections through the lateral and trinal cortex of a rat and through the medial and trinal cortex of a rat, if it's the 5A cells, so the cells that are here, that are projecting to other structures in the telencephalon, so if the hippocampus wants to communicate its output to the telencephalon, it should preferentially target the neurons in layer 5A. So that's what we studied. This is work from Shinya O'Hara in my lab. So we inject an enterograde tracer, which expresses a green fluorescent dye, and it also expresses a light-sensitive channel. So we can use light stimulation to do uh, electrophysiological experiments. But first of all, look at the anatomy. So this is an injection in the dorsal hippocampus, where, I'm sorry, this is an injection in layer 5B, of the entorhinal cortex and it projects to 5A and it goes all the way up. But in MEC, it lost its projection to 5A. 5B are the cells that mainly receive hippocampal output, according to a paper from Matt Nolan's work. 
So it looks a little bit funny that here you have an output coming in from hippocampus in the 5B, and then we look at the projection from 5B. They don't project to 5A, although 5A is supposed to provide an output to the neocortex. So to do the physiology, just to convince you that this is really true, here you have the cells in 5B that expresses this light sensitive channel, the OTIV. We record from cells in layer 5A, layer 3, layer 2B, and layer 2A. And essentially what we find summarized here that stellate cells in layer 2 don't get a lot of input from 5B cells. Calbinian cells in layer 5 in, in layer 2B get a beautiful input, as you can see here also in terms of the signal, the, the amplitude of the signal. Cells in layer 3 get massive input. But cells in layer 5A get very few input. And if there is an input, the amplitude of the current is really low. Now, just look at this bar and this one here and compare it to what we see in the lateral antrium critics. Here, almost all of the cells in 5A are driven by 5B cells, and the amplitudes are pretty substantial. So there is a difference in MEC and LEC in how the local network from 5B communicates with 5A. Now, as I said, this is the layer that receives the hippocampal output. This is the layer that projects to the cortex and to non-cortical structures in the telencephalon. So there seems to be a misconnection here, as if the hippocampus cannot talk to the output neurons in layer 5a. Of course, this is not an all or none phenomena. There are connections, as you see, in 5a in the medial antrial cortex here, but in lateral antrial cortex, is, it's a lot more striking. So this is the summary diagram of the circuitry. You have hippocampal output coming into LEC and into MEC, it hits 5B. 5B projects to 5A and it goes out to the telencephalon. It goes out to 3 and to 2B, but not to 2A that provides the main input. This is true here into 5B. 5B goes to 3, that projects here. 5B goes to 2B and to not to 2A that projects here. And there's a very sparse output here. So there is a misconnect in the dorsal part of the medial and trinal cortex. So then what is driving those output neurons that are supposed to talk to the cortex and to subcortical structures in the telencephalon? And very interestingly, we're now finishing up a study, which is a collaborative study between uh, Shinya O'Hara, who used to work in my lab, is, has now his own independent lab in, in Japan, where he came from. And we teamed up with a group in Germany, the group of Andreas Dragun and Alexei Egorov. He is the lead author, and this is the lead student, and this is Shinya, who really did all the experiments together. And so this is the finding that we have. Now we're looking at the whole circuit. So we drive the dorsal hippocampus, and again, again we express a light-sensitive channel we do our physiology. Here you see the recording in a slice. These are neurons in 5A. These are neurons in 5B. In green, you have the projection from the hippocampus in green. So we stimulate those fibers. We record from all these cells. You get beautiful volleys in 5B. You get very little in 5A. If we do this in the dorsal part of MEC, if we do it in the ventral part of MEC, there's no signal whatsoever. This, these are the light pulses. So you see a beautiful excitatory effect upon the light pulses, but the 5A signal is much weaker compared to the 5B signal. Realize these neurons are the ones that project to the telencephalon. These are the ones that are supposedly projecting here, but I just showed you that that's not the case or very sparse. If we now do exactly the same experiment, but now we drive the ventral hippocampus. Now look what is happening. You get beautiful activity in ventral MEC in 5B, beautiful activity. Look at the amplitude of 5A cells in ventral. But now there's not much in 5B compared to this. But surprisingly, there's a massive response of 5A cells. So in other words, 
the circuitry of the hippocampus suddenly has become a lot more complicated because now we have a dorsal hippocampal output that targets 5B cells that essentially, which is here, 5B cells, that target three cells, layer three and layer 2B, but not this one. And then it's the ventral hippocampus that actually has a circuit in this direction and here, but it also goes to dorsal MEC. So dorsal MEC output cells seem to in integrate output from the dorsal hippocampus with output from the ventral hippocampus. And functionally, those are quite different. So that may have implications, and we're currently uh, starting to do in, uh, in vivo experiments to see what this means. We don't know yet, but you can, we can postulate and we can discuss it um, by the end of the talk. So this is a summary. MEC and LEC layer 2 share a number of principles in terms of cells. They have layer 5. They share two sublayers. But there is this difference in dorsal MEC where neurons in 5B avoid 5A. So, so far, all the difference, all the data that I showed you don't help us a lot to explain what underlies this functional difference between LEC and MEC. So we decided to look for inputs. And so this is a summary figure, again, which is made for the chapter in the book, where I tried to summarize all cortical inputs that have been published in the literature in rodents and in monkeys. So you see lots of different cortical areas, lots of different cortical areas. And I just want to focus on some these two that seem to be specific for the medial and rhinal cortex here, and for the most more posterior parts of the monkey the, uh, and rhinal cortex, which we assume is similar to the medial and rhinal cortex, so the more posterior part. And this is the anterior part that is likely more similar to the lateral and rhinal cortex in the monkey, in the, in the rat, I'm sorry. And you could retranslate this into suppose that this is the human. So we think that this might true, hold true in the human as well. And we recently published a um, functional connectivity study that seems to indicate that the precipiculum indeed in humans also seem to have a preferred terminal distribution or connectivity with this part of the human antrinal cortex. Now, what do we know about this input? I'm going to focus on this one and not so much on this one in view of the time. We know that the presubiculum projects to layer one and layer three, and the parasubiculum projects to layer two in the rat. We see essentially the same pattern in the monkey. Presubiculum goes to three, layer one projection is less apparent, and the parasubiculum goes mainly to two and superficial three. So again, it shows that across species, these distribution of axonal projections seem to be pretty similar. And therefore, we started to do this human study, hoping to be able to define what is the medial and trinal cortex in humans. Now let's take a look at another example of cortical inputs, which is the inputs from the perirhinal cortex and the postrhinal cortex, or in primates, the parahippocampal cortex, which is subdivided in two domains, generally the temporal cortex field F and temporal cortex field H. They are color coded here, H, sorry. Color coded here, so you have the terminal distribution of axons here and here in blue. So if we just pay attention to the blue part, you see that this input overlaps quite a lot with the perirhinal input that we see in monkey and in rats. Now, this is the scheme that I showed you before. You have two perfect paths coming out of the lateral and medial. This is supposed to be what? This is supposed to be where? And this was based on the idea that the perirhinal cortex, which deals with object familiarity and object novelty, is a main input here. And the postrhinal or the parahippocampal cortex is a main input here. And that turns out to be incorrect. And just to show you one example, this was published uh, many, many years ago by Rebecca Burwell. This is a summary of percentage inputs to dorsal MEC where the grid cells are located. Look at the percentages of input. Lots of intrinsic MEC, quite substantial LEC, parasubiculum, presubiculum. But post-rhinal cortex is like 2.5%. So that's not a main input. 
This is another study from Dave Rowland. You see, this is a, a input to the medial entorhinal cortex, dorsal medial entorhinal cortex, lots of intrinsic, prepare subiculum, and post rhinal cortex doesn't even sit. I mean, it's other, other. So somewhere over here is post rhinal. So this whole idea of post rhinal being a main input here is based on a wrong interpretation of data. And we showed that very convincingly in a recent study that we published a couple of years ago in, in Cell Report, where we did, again, PET recordings in slices. So we make a slice and we record from pieces of entorhinal cortex. In this case, the lateral entorhinal cortex. We record from fan cells and we drive the input from the perirhinal cortex. And in, uh, in this case, with a, uh, and, and inputs from the postrhinal cortex. The postrhinal cortex is in green. It expresses a fluorescent label and it expresses this light sensitive excitatory channel. The perirhinal cortex, we do electrical stimulation or glutamate and caging stimulation. And what we find is that cells in, peer, in, in LEC do receive a high percentage of perirhinal input as well as postrhinal input. If you look at the different cell types in the entorhinal cortex, and these are all cells in layer two, they both, they, all of them receive a strong convergence of perirhinal and postrhinal inputs. So the whole concept of perirhinal being specific, perirhinal being specific for lateral and postrhinal being specific for medial is incorrect. The postrhinal and the perirhinal converge to a large extent onto cells in the lateral and rhinal cortex that then project into the hippocampus. Actually, these cells, the fan cells, and some others, and particularly the multiform cells, those are two classes of relin cells that project the dentate and CA3, do receive input not only from postrhinal and perirhinal, but also from the piriform, so the olfactory cortex. They receive input from the medial and trinal cortex, and they receive input from the other side of the brain. So these cells that project the dentate gyrus and CA3 and CA2, I should say, to be complete, are actually strikingly machines that converge information from many different sources, cortical sources in the telencephalon. So they're really converging systems. So summary number two, the difference in phenotype between LEC and MEC much likely represent differences in input, as I showed you in these summary diagrams of cortical inputs, and there are likely subtle local network differences that add on or emphasize those differences. MEC receives its main input from the prepare subiculum and from root spinal cortex. Those are all representing intrinsically generated spatial representations. LEC receives widespread cortical inputs that converge onto the layer two cells that project into the hippocampus. And they represent therefore a high level convergent a representation of the outside world. So it's a sensory generated representation of the outside world. So what we currently assume is that the entorhinal cortex is a continuum in terms of its networks, intrinsic networks, although there are subtle differences, as I pointed out, but those networks to a large extent deal with information in a similar way such that the hippocampus can use that as an input and build higher order representations that probably associate with what we call episodic memories. But they represent different sets of inputs. So MEC deals, deals with intrinsically generated inputs, whereas LEC deals with input that represent our sensory percept of the outside world. Now, interestingly, LEC and MEC are interconnected, and this is the last part of the talk. It was known for many, many years by work from David Amaral again, that if you put a label and you label the axonal plexus of a particular part in the entorhinal cortex here, or you do it here, you get this beautiful band-like structures that are intrinsically connected. And remember that these bands project to different levels of the hippocampus. This one would project to the dorsal hippocampus. This one projects to the ventral hippocampus. This one projects to the intermediate hippocampus. It's true in rats as well. It's true in mice. And interestingly, it's true in monkeys as well. You have strong intrinsic connections here 
here and here. This part projects to the posterior hippocampus. This one projects to the anterior hippocampus. So again, rodents and primates look very, very similar with respect to this topology, but also with respect to this band-like intrinsic connectivity within the entorhinal cortex. Combining that with our observation that in anterior cortex, the fan cells receive input from perirhinal cortex, which deals with objects, and from MEC, which deals with positions. And as I showed you, there are some cells in LEC, in, layer, in the superficial layers, that seem to be quite interested in coding for objects in position. So uh, Eric Samuel Nielsen in my lab started to ask the question, how is it that cells in the lateral and trinal cortex that get input in blue from the post trinal cortex and receives input in orange here from the medial and trinal cortex, how does that work? Is there convergence between those two inputs and what actually happens in terms of information processing in the cells in the lateral and trinal cortex? So we did the following experiment. We drive the perirhinal input electrically. We drive the MEC input optically, and here every peak is a light pulse that goes on. I should have put the light bars here. And we're recording from a bunch of these cells, the fan cells in layer two. So we get beautiful responses. If we stimulate perirhinal cortex, you get an excitatory volley. If you do multiple light pulses in MEC fibers, you get beautiful excitatory responses in these cells. So indeed, there is convergent input from perirhinal cortex that is involved in object recognition, and from entorhinal cortex that tells the animal an allocentric code for this is where I am in space. Cool. If you look at the two traces, there is an interesting difference. So this trace goes up, it goes down the baseline, and it flattens. Now look at this trace, and I'm going to blow it up a little bit. This one goes up, and it goes down below baseline, comes up. Then we have the next pulse, it goes down below baseline, below baseline. This means that in addition to an excitatory input, there seems to be an inhibitory input. And we were quite intrigued by this inhibitory input, so we pursued that a little bit more. So here we do a specific experiment where we label the MEC projections and record from fan cells, and then we compare them with the calbindin pyramidal cells in layer 2b and with layer 3 pyramidals. And this is the spontaneous firing of the cells when we just depolarize the cell. So we inject a current in this cell, depolarize it, and it starts to spike. Then we turn the light on, so we drive this input from the medial and trinal cortex. What you see is that the cell shuts down. You see it here. This is the raster plot. Each line is a single cell. All cells are happily firing because we depolarize them. We turn on the light, they silence almost to like no response whatsoever. We turn the light off and whoop, they come on. In layer two B cells, the calbinin pyramidal cells, or in layer three pyramidal cells, nothing happens, or if anything happens, they are actually excited. So they start to fire more. So in other words, there is a circuit that connects the medial antrinal cortex to the lateral antrinal cortex that has two opposing effects. If we drive this input, there is a strong inhibitory effect on this cell that projects the dente gyrus in CE3, whereas there is more of a stimulating or excitatory effect on this neuron that projects the CA1 subiculum. So the medial antrinal input simply said, a representation of space allows the two pathways from LEC to switch. This one is silenced. This one is preferred to fire into the hippocampus. We think that that excitatory input from here to there may actually come from the calbindin cells because a couple of years ago, we published a paper that shows that calbindin cells have a very strong excitatory input into the superficial layers of the lateral antrinal cortex. Now we're still working on this. So combining this piece of evidence with this excited piece of evidence, but it looks like a very logical and likely candidate. So 
where did this leave us? And this is likely true in all mammals. The entorhinal cortex mediates two parallel pathways. Medial EC integrates internally derived allocentric spatial information. Lateral EC integrates external sensory information with the MEC-based MEC information. Relin positive neurons in layer two receive and thus transmit very complex convergent information to the hippocampus. And therefore, I think that the entorhinal cortex is a main integrating component in the medial temporal lobe memory system. So it's not simply a structure that conveys information into the hippocampus and then conveys information from the hippocampus back to the cortex. It actually integrates that information already to a very high and complex level. And with that, I'll stop because I'm definitely running over time. I want to emphasize and thank the people who've done all the work. Eric worked on the lateral and trinal cortex, and Tom did all the work on the perirhinal and the postrhinal cortex. Shinya did all the intrinsic work on layer two and layer five in the entorhinal cortex. Bente did a lot of work on interneurons and worked together with Eric on the MEC, LEC component. I have an amazing team of people that helped me to run my lab. Without great, I would not be able to exist. We have our own viral core where Rajiv is really important. Two other technicians that helped me. A lot of work that I do in monkeys that I showed you is all coming out of the lab in Japan where Toshio Ijima used to be the head. It's now Kenny Chio too. And some of the work of the postdocs, Jay Cooley, he did the layer two work in the medial and trinal cortex, Rafael, who did a lot of work on uh, red spinal cortex, and Kong and Katrina, who did a lot of work initially on the intrinsic circuits of LEC and MEC. And of course, the people who make this all possible, the different funding organizations. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'll take questions. Thank you, Manuel. That was a fantastic talk, as was promised to the group, and I don't think that disappointed at all. Um, especially when you're like, wait, 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 we need to think, of, <laughs> we need to think about these things differently. Um, so who, everyone who's willing to stay around, I will definitely be here. I have time as long as Manuel has time to do a QA. and a um, So I'm going to start with those that are in the chat box. So there's a question. There are now two papers by the group of Ryan La Lumiere showing that the amygdala could modulate the activity in the hippocampus through the medial entorhinal cortex. Could you tell us more about the input from the basal lateral amygdala? Does the basal lateral amygdala target only layer five? It's it's a very good question, and to be honest, we yet don't know enough about the amygdala. So the amygdala inputs do not only target layer five, they seem to be more diffuse. It depends a little bit on the nucleus that sends the input, but the basal lateral nucleus in particular goes to layer three and layer five. So they it could potentially modulate both input and output circuits. The fact that in this paper, it's, it's reported that this is an input that's mediated by the medial entorhinal cortex or that the medial entorhinal cortex is really uh, susceptible to, to this input is probably because the, the paper focused on the medial and trinal cortex because the connectivity of the amygdala in almost all species with the lateral and trinal cortex is actually much denser than with the medial and trinal cortex. So our prediction is that if anything, the amygdala is gonna modulate the transfer of information from the medial and trinal, from, from the lateral and trinal cortex into the hippocampus, but also might modulate the output. Now, the finding in the medial entorhinal cortex, I think, is of interest, at least in my view, based on the data that I showed you, that the medial entorhinal cortex, where most of the experiments in those papers were done, is the dorsal part of the medial entorhinal cortex that gets this massive output from the ventral hippocampus. And the ventral hippocampus by itself is very strongly modulated by amygdala activation. So I, I think that they're looking at a very complex system that we now are touching upon and trying to understand a little bit better. But I think we really need much more data on, on the specifics of how do subnuclei of the amygdala target the different entorhinal components and can we exclude the hippocampus? So the, the 
optimal experiment would be essentially to silence the hippocampus and just look at what the amygdala does at the level of the entorhinal cortex. And I don't think we know. Thank you. All right, I'm trying to um, moderate. I see one hand raised, so I'm going to just deviate from the chat box quickly. If you'd like to unmute and ask your question, you may. If Thanks. May I go? go. Hey, Mino. Hi, Kai. Good to here. see you. Yeah. Good meeting you. Yeah, well, the the distinction between dorsal and the ventral for, for layer two, layer 5B and layer 5A, that was, that was very intriguing to me. And it looks like to me that the uh, ventral, ventral, ventral MEC is more like, more like LEC. Is that what, right? Yep, that's, what, that's what it looks like, yeah. Yeah. And it's just that, this dorsal part of MEC that is, is weird. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you agree to the idea, if, if, well, like, Ventral MEC is more more like LAC, more LEC like as a as a functional perspective. It it could be because the ventral part of LEC, uh, of MEC has shared a lot of the amygdala inputs, so that whole medial part of of the entorhinal cortex has a lot in common. In, in terms of they they still get a lot of olfactory inputs and higher order olfactory inputs. Right. Uh, they get a lot of, of amygdala and some other amygdala associated inputs like the bed nucleus uh, projects there. Uh, there's, a, there's some differences in, in the uh, cholinergic innervation as far as we know, but again, we're lacking some of the details there. So it, it's something to think about. Absolutely. Mm, mm. It, yeah, I'm asking. Developmentally, I don't know. Yeah, so, I'm asking yeah. this because you know we are focusing on, on recently focusing on the dopamine inputs to the internal cortex. Yeah, look looks like that the uh, the ventral MEC is receiving dopamine inputs, but not the dorsal one. But as you know, uh, LAC is also receiving dopamine. Yeah. So so ventral MEC and, and the lateral internal is kind of sharing to to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, that's yeah. what we are thinking about. Yeah, I, th so, I think it's a it's a very in interesting observation, and and it could very well be that we're just essentially making the wrong distinctions in the entorhinal cortex mm -hmm. by focusing on on lateral versus medial, or it's it's probably a lot more complex than than we use in in our schemes. All right. Thanks, Mino. Yeah. All right, so then the next question is, do you know whether different perforant pathway fibers coming out of the medial internal cortex carry different information to the hippocampus? If, if you mean the different fibers that originate from layer two and layer three, the answer is, I think so. And we've done some experiments. We haven't published them because there's a number of technical issues, but we will hopefully publish them at some point. So we did uh, retrograde viral tracing. Um, and it, it looks that the input set to layer three cells is not completely diff different from that to layer two, but there, there is a shared component and there are differences. So I think that the information that is transmitted by layer three neurons might be different from layer two neurons, but since two and three talk to each other as well, that I didn't have time to talk about because then my lecture would have taken at least two hours. Um, so, and, and I, I really don't know that much about functional differences. So we know that layer three cells in MEC do not seem to have a grid phenotype. The two B cells do. So the Calbinda cells and the Relin cells are both can both be grid cells. You hardly find grid cells in layer three. It's not that they're not there, but they're much sparser. Layer three cells are much more conjunctive. So they code for space and head direction. And they also now have been merged with the object vector cells. So in that sense, the answer is likely the information that is conveyed is different between the two. With respect to LEC, we absolutely have a, we don't have a clue. There's just no data on it. All right. I'm not sure if they're going to need to follow up, but I will take that as a thank you for that. Um, and the last question we have here in the chat box is, are there any projections from the lateral entorhinal cortex to medial entorhinal cortex that mirror the projections 
from the medial entrinal cortex to the lateral entrinal cortex? If not, any ideas of why this may be the case? So it's a double parter. It's a if. It's a it's or, a very good question. Yes. Yeah, and so. Let me be careful. So there is a back projection. There is a projection from LEC to MEC. Does it mirror the one from MEC to LEC? The answer is no, it does not, because that projection from LEC to MEC is strongly excitatory. And it actually originates from the Reland cells. And there's good evidence from the Nolan lab. And I think they have a paper that should have been out by now. Um, and we have similar data. Bente Jacobson did a lot of, of rabies input tracing to all these cell types. And so it's very clear that um, the layer two cells in MEC and the layer three cells in MEC, as well as the interneurons, do receive input from real and positive FEN cells in LEC. And that's not the case the other way around. So it, it really seems that LEC projects the MEC, MEC projects the LEC, but they use different cell types and different functional systems to communicate. LEC to MEC is striking, is mainly excitatory. MEC to LEC has this dual system where it excites one and inhibits the other population. But there's still, there's the, since the LEC data are not published yet, that means that we're still struggling a little bit with the data. So don't, don't take me that this is how it is, but that they are different for sure. Thank you. Well, we'll get the written version here soon. <laughs> of, <laughs> of the uh, and then the last question that I'll take before I wrap up is what might the functional differences be between layer two to dentate gyrus CA3 and CA2 versus layer three to CA1? So as you said, it, there is some indications that the cell types might carry different information or you could in, phrase it differently. They may integrate information sets in a way that the output looks functionally different. And we're still working on that because that, that takes an enormous amount of experiment. So we don't know. The interesting thing in terms of how they work with the network is that the input from layer two seems to really hit the hippocampus at entry point, the beginning of the whole hippocampal circuitry, whereas the layer three seems to be a shortcut projection. And that shortcut projection is reciprocal. So, I mean, the hippocampal output originates from CA1 subiculum, not from dentate CA3 and CA2. CA2 has a weak projection, but uh, I mean, it's mainly CA1 and subiculum. So there is a strongly reciprocal pathway in the entrinal cortex to CA1 subiculum, and there's an only unidirectional pathway into dentate CA3. And so the current interpretation, and there is a little bit of evidence for that, is that in ongoing behavior, CA1 and subiculum and entrinal cortex are continuously exchanging information on this is the current status, do I make, uh, do I generate as hippocampus, do I generate the correct output? So can I predict the next, event. And as soon as that prediction is wrong, then the, the current ideas, and as I said, there's sparse evidence for that, um, then there would be an error signal fed into dentate, like something is wrong here. So you're spitting out a prediction that doesn't fit my current sensory information that comes into the entrinal cortex. But there's no good evidence that, that ties the, the ID to the real firing of the cells, because then you should be able to measure like latency differences. And of course, in a slice, you can do that. And yes, there are latency differences, but we don't know whether that latency has anything to do with the functional information that is conveyed by the two. So I think we have to be really careful. All right. And then do you have time for one more question? We had one sneak in. Yeah, fine. Okay. Uh, so then the last one, actually the last one, is <laughs> are, is there any anatomical division in the MEC that corresponds to the different grid modules? And do you know if something similar exists in the LEC? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I just yes. Uh, are there any anatomical, is there any anatomical division in the MEC that corresponds to the different grid modules? Ah. That's a and good do question. you know if something similar <laughs> yeah. exists in the LEC? <laughs> cool question. And the answer is, we don't know. 
So we know that the modules are there and that we, we have beautiful recent data using a two photon imaging uh, with this small carry on uh, two photon microscopes in mice. Uh, the modules are there for sure. And they do have different locations in the medial antrinal cortex, but whether we can correlate it to a particular network or a particular type of cell network construct, we don't know. And in LEC, it's that's an hypothesis that we're trying to, to figure out. Um, and we just started to record from LEC, so it's too early to say. I would be surprised if there is no such thing because the networks look so similar. And I, I would assume that this is an important piece of information that the entorhinal cortex provides to the hippocampus to integrate into its memory representations. But it's just too, too early to, to say. So in the medial entorhinal cortex, it's likely that there's a correlate. We just don't know what it is yet. In, in LEC, could be. And so one of the, the most challenging or, or I think interesting or intriguing um, hypothesis is that it could have something to do with the cell clusters, that a cluster is a module, but it doesn't seem to work that way. Not yet, at least. So we're not there. So I don't know. To, to be uh, continued. Um, all right. Well, I want to thank you again. It was uh, a pleasure. Yeah, it was amazing to have you join us. Um, and hopefully by the time SFN uh, is is rolling around, we'll have that that chapter out with those beautiful figures for everyone to reference as well. Um, uh, so thank you again to Professor uh, Menno Woodard for joining us. I hope all of you come back next month on May 11th. It'll be at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'll tweet out the information. So some of us might be sleeping. I will be having dinner just after it on that time. Uh, but I want to thank you again, uh, Menno, and for everyone for joining and for the great questions. It's, it's a wonderful resource for the community um, to have you here and to have these conversations. So thank you, Kelsey and Robin, and uh, we'll see each other. All right. Thank you. Take care.